doctor of medicine. Tonight's story has the title, And There Was Darkness and There Was Light. Part one. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. And the qualities of the worthy physician are three. The eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hand of a woman. Our actual case history tonight concerns the field of psychiatry, the science of mental disorders. The object in point, a crucifix. The case in point, Frances A. Dunbar. She's 30 years old, married, she's given birth to three children. But for Francis Dunbar, the fourth arrival seems to be an exception. Even before its birth, there's a dispute in the mother's mind. And finally, the strange paths of her distorted and disorganized mental processes lead Francis Dunbar to a bizarre and frightening conclusion. Her unborn child must die. It has to be destroyed. For the authentic, documented case history, the patient in question, Francis A. Dunbar. This is not her face or her voice, but these are her actual words. I am not a famous person, so my story can have no value for that reason. My story is important because I am a human being, and because I went through a terrifying ordeal common to thousands of other human beings. What happened to me and to them can happen to you. It should not. It need not. This was to be my fourth baby, and I had great hopes for it. Not only because I love children, but because I thought with the birth of a baby would come automatic release from the fears that plagued me. Vague fears, indefinite, intangible. I, I was afraid, but most of the time, I didn't know what I was afraid of. Where or how or why these fears began, I, I didn't know. But I did know that they were growing and increasing to a point where I could no longer cope with them. I had heard from a neighbor of a case in which the birth of a baby had restored health to a sick mother. So I hoped and prayed it would happen that way with me. But the more I hoped, the more afraid I became. Afraid that it wouldn't happen that way with me. More and more afraid that as soon as my baby was born, I would surely and certainly kill it. Pain still come? Get Dr. Steiner. Yeah, he said we'd better get on over to the hospital. Have Mrs. Barstow from across the street to watch the kids. She'll be right over. Catch the things together? Over there. Oh. Hey, wait a minute. Uh. Wait a minute, Mama. Let me get that for you. Be sure and tell Mother when you come back. Let her know, huh? Yeah, all right. Take it easy, Mama. We got along this far. We don't want nothing to happen to that baby now. My period of labor was fairly brief, and the baby was born naturally and without complications. Actually, it was the easiest birth I'd experienced. And then they showed me my baby. Congratulations, Mrs. Dunbar. It's a baby girl. I'd had fears for the baby, even before the first time I saw her. But they were nothing compared to what I experienced in the days that followed. If I could only tell someone, anyone, keep the baby away from me. Leave her in the nursery. Everything would be all right. If the baby wasn't there, I couldn't do anything to her. Despite the fact I was not a member of the Catholic Church, I became very friendly with my two nurses, Sister Mary Frances and Sister Benedict. They seemed to take a personal interest in me. Even though a sense of shame and guilt kept me from confiding in them, somehow I, I think that they knew that something was wrong. 
One thing was certain. I couldn't possibly tell anyone. How could I explain what I had planned to do to this helpless infant beside me? What would they think of me? They were the same vague fears, nothing definite, nothing actual. I, I was afraid of dropping her, of picking her up and throwing her against the wall, doing anything to destroy her. I got sick to my stomach. I had feelings of drifting away, the, the same feelings I had before I even entered the hospital. I thought surely I was dying and, and the whole world dying with me, but it didn't happen. The nightmare went on. My roommate was Clara Castagnola, a generous, wonderfully healthy girl. Her maiden name was the Reardon. Most of the time, I was too sick to even think of eating. But apparently, Clara could think of nothing else. She ate everything the hospital diet offered, plus hamburger sandwiches and bananas, which her husband brought in. I tried my best to appear normal and well-adjusted, and yet I was deathly afraid to be trusted alone in the same room with Clara's baby. Whoops, I better not do that, huh, Fran? Evidence they'd catch me red-handed. I just better get some paper towels out of the bathroom and wrap this garbage up here. Clara, don't go, please. Uh, let me do it. I I'll get them for you. Oh, don't rustle a bone. Just lie back and relax. I gotta brush my teeth anyway. Keep an eye on Junior, will you? feel good? I'm all right. I feel fine. Everything's all right. Each passing hour, each day, my fears continued to grow. Wildly, uncontrolled. I came to the point where I couldn't look at a baby. Anyone's baby without wanting to hurt it. And all the while, the fears for my own baby's safety grew stronger and stronger. Despite the fact I loved her intensely, I, I spent hours thinking about how I should go about killing her. Clara Castagnola and her baby left the hospital two mornings later. It was strongly recommended I stay on at least a few more days. Dr. Steiner, our family physician, came to see me almost every day. Based on his own observations and reports from the ward nurses, he must have known something was wrong. When he asked me if I was troubled with some particular worry or anxiety, I answered him with a sudden outburst of sobbing and weeping. And when I calmed down, he questioned me further, but I told him nothing. I couldn't. I loved my baby, but she had to die. And I had to destroy her. How could he understand that? How could anyone understand? Well, bearing children is a very complicated process, mentally and physically. The postpartum or post-birth depression with most women is a matter of a few days. But sometimes it's more severe. It lasts longer. And occasionally it's very severe. See, many people harbor latent anxieties and fears that can be brought out and intensified by physical strain. Childbirth, for instance. And that's what you're saying about Fran. That her mind's abnormal. She's a little bit crazy. That's exactly what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying at all, Mr. Dunbar, because I don't know. I'm not a specialist in the field of psychiatry, but I do recognize that your wife has a definite mental disorder, and we have to see to it that she gets competent advice and treatment. Why did you come right out and say it, doctor? You think Fran's going crazy? I wouldn't say that, Mr. Dunbar. I couldn't say it, because I don't know. Well, I do know, doctor. I've been married to Fran for 11 years. I know her better than anybody. She's the same as you or me or anybody else. And nobody's going to tell me she's crazy. I don't care who they are. And I'm going to level with you, Doctor. I think this place is wrong for Fran. I think she'd be a lot better off going home. A lot better off. And I'm going to take her there tomorrow. Mr. Dunbar, I advise against it. I think you're making a bad mistake. Fran is sick. She needs help. She needs treatment. She needs psychiatric consultation. Well, I figure I know my life, and I'll take that chance. Good night.
Honey, I don't get it. What's the matter? Why can't you come home now? Because I can't. I'm still weak. I... It's the baby, George. I, I just can't cope with it now. I... I guess I need more rest. Oh, come on. You've been here a week already. It costs money. Besides, why, Dolly, we don't want to have you gold-breaking on this job now, do we, Mom? George, will you please stop calling me Mama? I've told you before, I don't like it. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. How about all this? You sure it ain't got nothing to do with what that doctor told me about emotions and things? Your mental condition. Naturally not. Don't be silly. There's no insanity in our family. Never a trace of it. I don't know where they got that idea. It's a terrible thing to say about anybody. Well, then you're all right. I, I mean, outside you're being a little bit tired. You're perfectly all right. Well, of course I am. Why do you make such a point of it? That, that's all I wanted to know. We're going to make it tomorrow, Mama. Doctors and no doctors. Tomorrow, we're taking you home. Tomorrow, they would take me home. And they would take my baby home. But there was still one night remaining. And I awoke in the darkest hours of that night. And there was the picture before my eyes, moving, playing. It was as if someone had opened a small secret window and, and I could look through and see a segment of tomorrow. And I saw clearly for the first time how I intended to kill my child. It was the living room at home. The fire was going in the stove. The baby was in a crib. And I was sitting in a chair. No one else was in the room. Then I saw myself get up, cross over, and take the baby from her crib. But I turned and started slowly for the stove. I saw the whole picture in my mind down to the smallest detail. The sweater that I was knitting and pink roses on the baby's crib, bright fire leaping in the stove. I held the baby in my arms. I saw myself opening the door of the stove, wide open. I paused a moment, I looked at the fire, and I started to move the baby toward the flame. <laughs> Dr. Steiner was the first to see me before I left the hospital. He repeated his disapproval of my leaving. He gave me one last lecture and prescribed a course of medication and got a promise from me I'd call him whenever I felt trouble coming on. It was a promise I had no intention of keeping. Mental illness, psychosis, insanity, we considered anything like that a social stigma, a blot on our family name despite Dr. Steiner's urgent recommendations and pleas to recognize my mental condition and to accept competent psychiatric help. All three of us, my mother, my husband, myself, rejected his advice on the spot. So we closed ourselves in, my husband, my mother, my children, my new baby. Hours fell into days, days into weeks. I didn't even talk about my fears anymore. They were too much a part of me. One particular week, it seemed my mind was in torture for all of eternity. But no matter what I did or thought, I still hadn't mentioned the idea of the stove to anyone. No, that was my secret. But the fears grew. I was helpless to do anything about them, and sometimes I really wondered if I wanted to. Finally, the fears obsessed me to such a degree where I could see myself going to the crib, picking up the baby and starting toward the stove. And each time the scene appeared before me in my mind, I, I'd see myself closer to the stove. And then I could see myself next to the stove. And finally, I could see the stove door open. And I could see the baby inside. These were the only images I created for myself. There were others, but they were fantasy. All of them silly imaginings. I, Mother kept telling me that, and, and so did George, and I kept telling myself, it isn't, it isn't real. It's silly, it isn't real. 
Use willpower. That's all it takes. Use willpower, of course. That's it. Willpower. Then it was the 5th of December. It was snowing outside. The children were in school, and my husband was at work. My mother was next door with a neighbor. And I was in the living room alone with my baby. Mrs. Dunbar. The baby? She's perfectly all right. Are you just trying to relax? But the stove. I tried to put my baby in the stove. She's all right. Try to forget about it. Try not to think about it. Oh, I can't forget it. I can't help it. It'll happen again. I know it will. I'll, I'll kill her. I know it. Mrs. Dunbar. I know it. It doesn't have to happen this way. We can change all that. But we can't do it alone. We're going to need your help. Can we count on it? Mrs. Dunbar, will you help us? Anything. But don't let it happen. Don't let me kill my baby. I'll 
do anything. Anything, I'll do anything. I, I don't get it, Doctor. You say she doesn't know what she's doing. I just saw her. She looks all right to me. Mr. Dunbar, let me put it this way. At the time, your wife didn't know what she was doing. I believe she was mentally deranged. Oh, you must be wrong, Doctor. Well, that's a terrible thing to say about my daughter. It's shameful. There is no insanity in our family. There never was. I should know I'm her mother. Well, there's one thing I'd like to point out, Mrs. Thompson. Heredity has very little to do with most cases of mental illness. In 90% of the cases, you don't inherit a sick mind. You acquire it. What do you mean by that? Well, when a child is born, you might say his mind is a blank. There's no love, no hate, no fear, no prejudice, nothing. In a sense, the parents and the environment can shape that child's mind a thousand different ways can be encouraged to develop normally or abnormally. It can be steered along a rational course or an irrational one. And I'm to blame for all this? Is that your point? No, Mrs. Thompson, that's not the point at all. I'm concerned with a cure. Francis can't go on this way. I think you both realize that. What do you suggest? Francis has been examined by three psychiatrists, our top men in the field. And they all recommend the same thing. Care and treatment at an institution. I've reviewed their findings and the circumstances of the case very carefully. And as your family doctor, I must say, I agree with them. At the moment, a psychiatric hospital appears to be the best possible answer. An insane asylum. <gasps> oh, this is crazy. Oh, terrible shame. <laughs> Would you tell me something, please? If you don't feel shame if you have a broken leg, why should you feel shame if you have a fear complex? We plead an age of enlightenment. You're perfectly respectable if you have trouble with your gallbladder, but don't ever dare admit to a psychoneurosis. Mrs. Thompson, isn't it about time we get over this foolishness? It's never happened before. Not in our family. Never before. Oh. I, don't, I don't want Fran to go. I don't want her to go. If she goes, you'll be separated for a while. But you'll have a good chance for a cure. If she stays here, you'll have to watch her every minute. And even then, there's a chance you may wake up some morning with a tragedy on your hands. A terrible tragedy. I leave it to you two. Which is the best way? Nine days later, on a Wednesday afternoon, I made preparations to leave for the state psychiatric hospital. My commitment to the psychiatric hospital was entirely voluntary. With work, hard work, I could be cured. I made up my mind I would be cured. Before I left, George brought the children to have them say goodbye. It broke me up quite a bit, but I choked back the tears and put on a fairly cheerful front. Then it was over. And so I started on my uncertain journey to the uncertain future. Still afraid, still plagued with fears, and yet Deep inside me, a small hope was growing. A new hope. There was nothing to lose, but there was everything to gain. Thus, the first segment of Frances Dunbar's true story, documented from her actual case history. Frances Dunbar is neither alone in her affliction, nor is her case unique. And if the retelling of this story has helped only one person survive his own private nightmare of fear. It has served its purpose. <laughs>